Good morning. Welcome to the science of beer. We're going to wait about another minute or so, and then uh, we'll get started with the panel discussion. Okay, well, uh, let's get started. Uh, good morning again. I'm Larry Marnett, the Dean of the School of Medicine Basic Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this morning's program on the science of beer. This event is hosted by the School of Medicine Basic Sciences as part of our monthly series called Lab to Table Conversations. Today, we're excited to have with us beer experts to connect the dots between brewing, its history, its science, and biomedical research. The earliest known evidence of beer production was thought to be around 7,000 years ago, but recent studies found traces of beer production 13,000 years ago in what is now Israel. Beer or similarly produced drinks have been part of human history and civilization. Beer was used for protecting against waterborne illness, as a bartering tool in economies, and in social and spiritual activities. How long has this history produced a growing understanding of beer science? How is the understanding changing brewing and beer? And how does this connect to biomedical research? I'm excited for the panel today to delve into these questions. One housekeeping note, please place your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We've also received numerous questions from registration and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the moderated discussion. So I'm pleased to turn the conversation over to the moderator, Bruce Carter, professor of biochemistry and associate director of the Vanderbilt Brain Institute. Bruce. Thanks, Larry. Welcome everybody. I'm excited to be here and to be talking about one of my favorite pastimes, uh, brewing and consuming beer. Um, <clears throat> so I've been a home brewer for about 30 years. I had a, a real interest in the brewing process for a long time and actually used to teach a class on brewing with a good friend of mine, John Janusek, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. But um, I learned a lot about the history and culture of brewing from John. Um, and I'm excited to hear some of the perspectives that our panelists can provide. Um, so I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. Uh, we'll just go around and tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, Linus, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Linus Hall. I'm the owner and founder of uh, Yazoo Brewing, along with my wife, Lila. Um, I have an engineering background originally and moved to Nashville to start work with uh, Bridgestone Firestone, but I uh, was an avid home brewer like you, Bruce, and that's all I could talk about. And so eventually, you know, got the idea to start a brewery. And uh, we started in 2003. Um, I did go back to school and get a, a degree, at, uh, an MBA from uh, Owen School of Vanderbilt. So that's my connection to Vanderbilt. Um, and uh, we just celebrated 18 years. Uh, we've moved now up to uh, a property along the river in, um, in Madison, you know, north of town. Um, and uh, I'm excited to hear this conversation. All right, great, thanks. Uh, Bailey, you wanna go next? Sure, yeah, my name's Bailey Spaulding. Uh, I'm the founder of Jackalope Brewing uh, here here in town. Uh, my, my background is uh, actually, I'm, I'm from uh, Vermont originally and uh, my undergrad uh, degree was in biological anthropology. Uh, so kind of more on the evolutionary side of things. Um, I decided to go to law school uh, at Vanderbilt, which is what brought me down here. And in law school, I started homebrewing and just kind of fell in love with homebrewing and 
similar to Linus. Uh, it was all I wanted to talk to people about. <laughs> and But luckily when you're in grad school, that's pretty much all people want to hear about anyway. Uh, so, uh, so I spent law school homebrewing and kind of dreaming up a brewery. And so uh, opened Jackalope in 2011. So we just, uh, yeah, we, we're, at, we're at a decade now. Um, and yeah, our, our facility that we opened, we moved to a, a couple of years ago uh, is over in, in Wedgwood, Houston on, on Houston Street. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk to everybody. Great, thanks. Um, and now our, our real hardcore scientist here, Andrzej Belinsky. Want to introduce yourself, Andrzej? Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, Bruce, uh, my name is Andrzej Belinsky. I'm in the Department of Chemistry. I manage analytical chemistry laboratory. It's a facility that provides uh, training uh, to <clears throat> most of our undergraduate students that uh, take analytical chemistry, graduate students and researchers. And uh, I'm very passionate about beer. I'm very passionate in general about uh, fermentation. I actually used to teach uh, a, a module you now on capstone, capstone course devoted to fermentation and in beer in particular, actually. So that's where uh, my connection is. Okay, great, thanks. Well, I thought maybe we could just open up with discussing a little bit of the history behind beer. Um, you know, what's the history of, of your business in, in beer? Uh, both Linus and Bailey can talk about your, your own business as well as in Nashville. And, and Bailey, maybe you want to talk about some of the, uh, the ancient history of beer and the debate, which is first, bread or beer? <laughs> uh, uh, Bailey, you want to kick us off? and, and Sure. I mean, of... <laughs> you probably know what side I'm on uh, for that one. <laughs> but um, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I, again, I, I think we're, we're still really finding out um, how uh, how long ago cultures started brewing? Um, you know, yeah. There's I think ev evidence from about thirteen thousand years ago now in Israel. There, previous to that, uh, there were some uh, po you know pots found in um, in China that had um, residue of a, of a beer like beverage. Um, so it, it was you know clearly you know really important in. Uh, in ancient cultures, and yeah, there's there's a theory that it's actually what drove agriculture. That the planting of the the barley uh, to make the beer is actually what drove kind of a settled agriculture, uh, 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 you know. Uh, uh, my brain's blanking, but settled agriculture. So yeah, uh, agrarian uh, society. There you go, <laughs> and. Um, uh, you know, there, there is there is a debate about that, um, and I think you know it, it was very uh, a, a very spiritual beverage uh, in a lot of cultures, and, and and continues to be somewhat as well. I think uh, you know the, there is uh, a little bit of magic happens in that fermentation process um, that it took people thousands of years to understand um, what what was going on, and so you had. Um, I think the most famous one would be uh, uh, Ninkasi, who is the uh, Sumerian goddess of brewing. And what's I think re remarkable about that, about her in particular, is that there's uh, tablets with the hymn to Ninkasi that are uh, written on it. And so it actually describes who she is and then also what their uh, brewing process was like um, in, the, in the Sumerian culture. Um, and so it's I think that's probably the most famous of kind of the, the spiritual examples of it. But I think in kind of all of those cultures, um, it was, you know, really um, that, that fermentation is magic. And it really wasn't until fairly recently that we were able to unlock some of the secrets of it. So um, yeah, I feel like I've covered some ancient history stuff. I'll, I'll give it to Linus now. <laughs> yeah, and Linus, maybe you can mention a little bit about the brewing history in Nashville itself, as well as, you know, you were one of the earlier breweries here for sure. So yeah, yeah um, I mean, probably the most well-known brewery uh, was back in the 18, late 1800s within uh, the Nashville Brewing Company, which was then turned into uh, 
to Gersbury. Um, it's kind of over by where uh, Tennessee Brew Works is now and that little, uh, that little neighborhood there. Um, but they didn't make it after Prohibition for very long and closed in 1954. So for the longest time up until the late 80s, there were no breweries at all in Nashville. Um, and then uh, four brew pubs, uh, small brewery operations that were attached to restaurants opened up. If anybody remembers uh, Bosco's and Market Street, uh, Big River and, um, and Blackstone. Uh, but they weren't focused on you know, packaging their beer for outside consumption outside of their restaurants. And um, so we were actually probably the first uh, one focusing on packaging our beer and getting it out when we opened in 2003. Uh, and then we were kind of the only packaging brewery for a long time until uh, <laughs> until Bailey started Jack Lope. Uh, what was that, 2011? 11, yeah, it was eight, yeah. it was like you and then eight years and then us, which is crazy to think about what's happened in the past eight years, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, now it's kind of exploded. I, I think we're up to over 30 breweries um, in the Nashville kind of metro area. And, you know, sure, a few of them have, have come and gone, but uh, for the most part, it's a really healthy uh, scene. A lot of, you know, obviously a lot of uh, collaboration and com camaraderie in the, in the scene. And, um, but I still, I think there's a lot of room to grow. Um, it's getting a little bit saturated, but there's still places where you can't even find, you know, a good local beer on tap or in, in a bottle or can. So, um, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I should give a, a shout out too to, to Scott Murdy, who is a local historian who's done a lot of research on, on brewing here. And he uh, is reproducing Nashville Brewing Company beer as uh, Nashville Brewing um, here in, in partnership with Jackalo, or uh, not Jackalo, uh, Blackstone. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so maybe what we can uh on to is what what defines beer so of course so i think a lot of us think back to the reinheitsgebot uh, the german purity law which said that it could only be hops barley and water and they didn't know about yeast until louis pasteur came on the scene but um and, and that was what was legally defined as beer and couldn't be added anything else added like with a few exceptions the germans allowed um but nowadays, there's so much variety. You know, the sours where they use all kinds of different ingredients and different microbes. Um, and there's these really high alcohol content beers. And so I'm just wondering, you know, for, for all of our panelists, to you, how do you define beer? And um, are you more of a like purist or do you think there's a lot of room for experimentation and how we define it? Um, anybody want to jump in and start that? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I guess I'm more of a purist. I, I think it should be some type of malted grain where you're getting your sugars for, from. Uh, uh, hops are just one of many, you know, spices that you can add to, you know, to flavor and kind of counteract the sweetness of the malts. Um, you know, water's a given, I guess. But uh, and, and yeast, you know, there's so many different varieties that you can experiment with. Um, but yeah, I think that's beer. I mean, adding uh, you know sugar uh, to water and fermenting it with some type of uh, you know factory drive flavoring to me that's not beer. I mean, that's that's hard seltzer, but that's that's not beer. So, so I guess um, we don't subscribe to the Ryan Heights boat, but uh, I think it's a good place to start. Yeah, I would say I agree with Linus. Um, I'm I that it, it needs to really be you know malted grain based for me we and we do we do a decent amount of playing around with adjuncts as far as you know our bear walker um is brewed with uh maple syrup in it as well and then our lovebird is brewed with strawberries and raspberries with the secondary fermentation and so we we play around but you know almost all of our alcohol is derived from um from green and we we don't play around with yeah, things that would make it be more like a hard seltzer. Um, sorry, my my snootiness came out. But uh, I uh, yeah, I, I I agree that I'm I'm mostly a purist, but I also like to play around and and like Linus was kind of alluding to too. There's a lot of variety in you know just those four ingredients can can you can play around with forever and get very 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 different things um, within 
in those ingredients. So I, I think I like I like to focus on that. Sanjay, what, what defines beer for you? Or maybe you could comment on the the different types of microbes that are in some of the different beers. Oh, uh, yeah, and unfortunately, I do want to provide different perspective, but I'm with Bailey and Linus. I, uh, I am more of a purist when it comes to, when it comes to beer. And uh, yeah, and I think Linus hinted on that a little bit, that currently the vast amount of uh, yeast and bacteria available on the market to, to create a, a beverage that has multitude of flavors and it's still within the realm of that you know pure approach to to the to the beer itself and 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 I'm talking here about the, the regular fermentation and uh, using you know different yeast together or talking about mixed fermentation in terms of uh, bringing uh, bacteria to yeast or you know making a beverage that is predominantly uh, bacterial fermentation based uh, and I think one of the great examples of a classic beer that has a large variety of microbes would be the lambics, right? I, I read somewhere that there's an, over 80 different types of microbes identified in the lambics. Um, maybe somebody could explain what a lambic is and is, are any of you brewing lambics at the brewery? Well, I know have done something like that recently. Yeah, we um, we have a whole side uh, project um, called Embrace the Funk. Uh, it's a series of you know mostly barrel aged and wild and sour beers. Um, so we'll make the uh, the work you know the, uh, the basically the barley sugar water here at the brewery and then put it in um, stainless steel containers and truck it over to our warehouse up kind of off Elm Hill Pike over by the airport. Um, and sometimes we even like you know just pump that work into a cooling vessel hot and let it just naturally cool overnight with whatever you know microbes are in the environment um, to, to inoculate it and start fermentation that way. Um, but we also intentionally are adding things like Britannomyces and Pediococcus, Lactobacillus, um, different you know saison yeast strains. Um, and then and making that style of beer, it, it's got a lot more parallel to, uh, to making wine than it does beer in a lot of ways because you're aging it sometimes for three years and it's blends of different barrels. And you don't really know exactly what it's gonna taste like when you first start the process. So um, yeah, but so, you know, that, that would be, the Lambic styles are mostly, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the Brussels area in, uh, in Belgium where they do let the beer naturally um, inoculate overnight while it's cooling down, um, barrel age it and do different blends of you know, up to three years, uh, different blends. Um, and they do not like it when Americans uh, call their beers Lambic. So we always say it's in, it's in that tradition. Uh, well, maybe we could explore a little bit more in detail some of the, the different science science is behind some of these ingredients. So we, we talked a little bit here about the, the yeast, but um, let's start with a really basic ingredient, um, water, right? All, beer is over 90% water. So that's a really important ingredient in beer. And uh, maybe you can say something about the process you use to get the water the way you like it. Um, people a lot of times will add different ions or acids to, um, give beers a certain flavors. Uh, Bailey, maybe you can start and tell us about how you sure. guys use water in, at Jackalope. Yeah, yeah. So um, like like most urban breweries, our, our water source is just Metro, you know, Nash Nashville city water. Um, and so the first step is, um, is kind of the, the, the filtering process on it. So we use, um, uh, carbon, an active carbon filter and a particle filter. Um, Nashville water is, 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 you know, great, you know, great drinking water, uh, but I'm sure if you've had it, it's, you've noticed it's very highly chlorinated. Um, and so chlorine is um, like, like, let's say you're home brewing and you don't use distilled or filtered water, you're going to end up with like a very 
bitter acrid uh final beer product so the chlorine in your the chlorine that you might not notice when you're just drinking it as much in your final beer will be very off-putting so uh, the first step is to get is to kind of filter anything that you want of it uh want out of it um and some breweries will use reverse osmosis we we just use the the carbon and, and the particle filters um, and then it's adding back in what you do want in it. So uh, it kind of depends on, on the beer styles. Um, uh, ales, you want harder water. Um, lagers, you want softer water. So um, we'll add and we'll add minerals um, in, into our ales that we won't necessarily put into our lagers. Um, you can add them at different points. Um, different. Some will kind of, um, give you kind of highlight the maltiness in your beer. Some you can add to highlight the hops in your beer. Um, we'll also, yeah, we'll add lactic or phosphoric acid um, to uh, play with play with the pH of it a little bit as well. Um, since the, the pH of your your mash and, and your wort uh, is, is important. So, yeah. And Linus, do you have anything to add? Like what you guys use a similar process? Or? We do, and, and it's always funny when we're giving tours, we talk about using you know, good old Cumberland River water um, for our base. <laughs> but uh, I, I actually think it's it's really good water for brewing. Um, you know, like Bailey, we, we run it through an activated uh, charcoal filter to get the chlorine out. And um, the thing with brewing is uh, the pH of your mash is very important to how much extract you get out of the grain and what flavors. Um, and so you need a certain amount of, you don't want to use just pure RO water. You know, you won't get the buffering uh, for the pH that you need. So um, we'll, we'll use things like, like gypsum or calcium uh, carbonate, uh, calcium sulfate and calcium chloride to try to get um, the mash to buffer out at about, you know, 5.2 to 5.4 is where you want it to be. And then the, the calcium part of those minerals is really important for um, a lot of things, but for yeast health, it's very important um, for uh, the kind of quality of the bitterness you get out of uh, using hops in the boil, the, the calcium comes into play there too. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think Nashville is blessed with, you know, you know, a good source of water. I mean, I would hate to be, you know, a California brewery right now when they're getting their water almost you know, rationed to them. So um, we're lucky to brew here. And Andre, maybe you can say a little bit about the chemistry. So like with the pH, wh why is that important to have a certain pH, for example, in the mash process? Well, it's, it will really affect uh, extraction efficiency. And, and it, it's crucial for, especially in craft beer industry, where uh, resources or uh, it's, it's, it's quite expensive. So it's very important for Linus and Bailey to be able to control uh, pH of uh, of their water. Just there are multiple other aspects of it that, going in further, but uh, during the saccharification process, yeah, it's, it's crucial. It's very important. And keeping in mind that uh, quite a bit of that chemistry and its solubility, it's pH dependent. So it's 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 imperative to 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 control the pH in order to be able to control the extraction efficiency. Uh, and I think one of the things that we're talking about the sacrification process and everything for, for simple folks, maybe an easy way to look at it is the enzymes, right? The, the amylase, as a biochemist, I think about enzymes. And um, so amylase, maybe you can talk about like the different amylases and their pH optimums. Anybody want to talk about that? Or... No. Okay, well, <laughs> there's alpha and beta amylase. So when you, you have this starch that comes from the malt, you need to break that down to sugar so the yeast can eat it, right? And so there's two main amylases that are produced by the, the barley, the alpha and the beta, and then that breaks down that starch molecules and they have pH optimums. Um, so that's, it's really important to hit that pH for, for that pur purpose as well. Um, well, maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about hops, one of my favorite topics. Um, hops are such an interesting component of beer in a lot of ways. Um, what kind of hops do you guys like to use? Do you, like, I think it's, uh, 
maybe it's some of the brewers I know will travel to the local farms and actually smell the hops. But let, let's just start off talking about like, what is a hop? Tell us about the hop plant, how you get the, the important ingredients out of it. Anybody want to tackle that? Linus, sure. in your head. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Bailey, do you want to go? Go ahead. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll go for it. So yeah, they're, they're, uh, hops are a really uh, kind of beautiful uh, vine plant. Um, the part that we use in brewing uh, is the female flower. Um, it kind of looks like a green leafy pine cone. Um, when they're growing, you know, they're harvested once a year, um, typically in August or September in, in the US. Um, and so for generally by the time they come to a brewery, they've been uh, dried and pelletized um, and you've got data on them as far as their alpha and beta uh, acids and their um, oil levels and, and things like that. So you, you know kind of what you're, what you're putting in your beer and, and, and um, what kind of volumes you're, you'll need. And again, they are kind of, they're, there's what like you, if you're going to use them fresh, undried in beer, you really need to get them in ideally within 24 hours of being harvested, which is uh, impossible, you know, 364 days a year. So, um, so typically we're, we're using um, dried, uh, dried hop pellets um, or, or whole leaf hops. Um, and then now there's new, there are some new um, kind of technologies coming out, some new innovations in hops as far as um, trying to be able to optimize, you know, the amount of um, aroma or bitterness, which are the two main things you're getting out of it, um, with having minimal amount of kind of the, the vegetal side of it, which um, can uh, can impact your yields. You know, again, when Andres was talking about um, a big thing for us being kind of the, the, the cost of making our, our beverages, uh, when you're making and, you know, let's say the, the big the hazy IPAs are such a big thing right now. They're so, so, so hop heavy and they're mostly late additions. So those are mostly um, added either um, in the whirlpool when you're done boiling or in, in the dry hop, uh, which is actually in the fermenter. Um, you'll end up with a lot of uh, leftover um, hop, you know, vegetal matter. If you can kind of make it so you have a higher ratio of, of the oils that you're looking for um, and, and the material you're looking for with less of that vegetal material, you can get a higher yield and you know get a couple extra barrels out of that out of that fermenter. Um, you'll you'll be able to uh, maybe sell it for a little bit more or just make a little bit more money um, off of that beer. So that that side of it is is really important as well. Um, I feel like I've gone down a tangent here. <laughs> no, that, that's fine. I, I mean, there's so many different ways to, to add these hops and, and for different reasons. Linus, would, are, do you guys have any um, way that you like to do the dry hopping or um, use specific hops? Yeah, you know, um, dry hopping is an old technology or, or way of doing it, but it's really become... Um, popular in an American style, you know, hazy IPAs or New, New England IPAs, they're called. Um, and you'll actually, uh, traditionally, you would add dry hops uh, in the, like the English tradition would be adding them to the cask right before you bung it up and send it off to the pub. Um, but nowadays, people are adding uh, hops, you know, during active primary fermentation. And you're, it's kind of a controversial topic, and it's not really well understood what's happening. But there are certain things that uh, they call biotransformation of different dials, I think, that are happening. The yeast will take in uh, some of these, um, these precursors and convert it to much more aromatic uh, uh, chemicals. Um, and so we, yeah, a lot of breweries now are adding some of their dry hops, you know, after you know, day one or day two of the, of the fermentation instead of waiting for the fermentation to be over, the yeast to settle out and then adding your hops. So. And all, you know, all those different ways of adding the hops, uh, you know, contribute 
a little bit of bitterness, but mostly the aroma and the um, the flavor that you would get out of whatever hot rider you're using. And then, of course, there's a lot of complex chemistry. You, you brought up a little bit, Linus. Um, Anjay, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the chemistry of like, why are hops bittering in one way and then provide these fruity flavor or aromas in, in the other way? Yeah, so when it comes to this, it's uh, uh, so like Bailey and Linus uh, already mentioned, Bailey, Bailey actually, uh, in terms of uh, bittering versus aroma hops. And that's a, it's a very general division. There are uh, quite a bit of actually cultivars that are in between can serve as both. Um, uh, when it comes to actual chemistry of bettering versus aroma. So when it comes to bettering, there is uh, in general, the terminology that's used in brew brewing, we call it the, about alpha acids and beta acids. And alpha acids are compounds called humulons. Uh, there are adhumulons and cohumulons, and this is the majority pretty much of the bittering uh, process, if I may say. There are also beta acids. They uh, are uh, lupulons and colupulons and, and, and adlupulons, so very similar terminology to, uh, to alpha acids. And uh, the aroma part, and this is when it's actually getting very interesting uh, for me, and it's, that's where the much bigger connection as with a uh, biomedical world is uh, the terpene profile that makes the aroma of hops and how it differs from one cultivar to the other. And um, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, uh, we could talk about myrcene. We already talked about myrcene actually prior. Uh, uh, linalo, uh, Humulene uh, and caryophyllin. Caryophyllin is a very interesting one because it's uh, actually a, uh, <clears throat> a our endocannabinoid uh, receptor activator, and in particular, actually, it, it, it interacts with CB2. And uh, there is quite a bit of research cr currently toward that and in terms of inflammation. And I just read recently paper, I was actually looking for it. And uh, I, I could just uh, mention for those who don't know, endocannabinoids are the endogenous compounds that are very similar to the compounds you get in marijuana. Um, and there's a lot of interest in medical use for that, obviously, but sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's, and, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to distill sentences to uh, not take too much uh, uh, of a time, but uh, uh, it's really fascinating that we, that we actually have those uh, endocannabinoid enzymatic systems. And, and uh, uh, caryophyllin uh, currently is actually looked uh, at as a possible target to deal with inflammation in, in COVID-19. If someone is interested, interested I can provide uh, references and resources to it. I read a lot of papers recently like that. And a lot of that chemistry is actually in hops and in cannabis. And to what Bruce had mentioned is, uh, you know, some breweries will actually play with different variety of aroma hops to target specific profile of certain strain of cannabis to uh, make their product in a way more attractive, if that makes any sense. A lot of West Coast IPAs have actually that profile that kind of smells like, like cannabis to actually uh, uh, put, add another perspective to it. Whenever I was, uh, when I was teaching Capstone and we were working on uh, hop extractions with students, people passing by often ask me questions. Are, are you guys smoking uh, marijuana in there? <laughs> and, and yeah, it was, a, no, it's just, you know, we're playing with all those terpenes that we extracted from hops and it's just, it's amazing. And uh, it, it, I wanted to mention actually too, that there's a local brewery that did I would say academic quality research on that, and it wasn't really that wasn't their target. Their uh, target was they struck they were struggling with getting hops that they really wanted for their beers, and uh, they came up came up with the really cool idea. Whenever there was scarcity of certain cultivar in the market, they started blending other hops that were available to reach the target of that hop of the terpene profile of the hop that they could not buy at the time because it was just wasn't available. And 
Bailey and Linus know, you know, how long does it take actually to, there is a line to get into the cultivar or distributor of the hops to actually start getting that hop. You have to sign up to after a year actually receive your first delivery. And it, so uh, Linus and Bailey, do you um, have like a certain types of hops you look for routine, routinely or do you have certain hops that uh, then you're in line for and you can get, and so you brew the beer based on that. Yeah, there, there are some uh, pretty hot kind of hyped up varieties that are very difficult to get. Um, and, you know, like Andre was saying, it, it's, it's kind of wise if you're a brewer to not use one particular hop to try to use different blends. So that, if, you know, if one is a bad harvest or, you know, it's sold out for the year, you can at least, you know, it, it's one of five hops or something that you're, you're using in your IPA. Um, but yeah, we, we use a lot of, uh, of Amarillo, uh, Sabco, Strata. Um, uh, like Bailey said, I'm not a huge fan of Simcoe. <laughs> I definitely get the, uh, the cat or captains there. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times uh, we'll get enough to not do a full year's production of a beer, but we'll turn it into a seasonal and maybe just do, you know, uh, two or three months worth of production before we run out of hops and, and have to you know, start the next, the next, the next project. Yes, same, you know, we have our, um, the hops that we keep in our, our core beers uh, contracted. You can contract um, a few years ahead of time. Um, so, uh, and that's kind of how you uh, just try to get your little, your little hold over, over what you need. Um, and then, yeah, if there's something that it's like, oh, um, you know, cit Citra is one of, the really big ones of the past you know decade it's like we'll do this one you know and i think typically i feel like for me i i really like the citrusy grapefruity tangerine hops uh, quite a bit Cit citrus kind of one of those it can, it can be a little like fruit loops as well um and uh yeah we i think we 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 kind of do both we have the ones that we we really need and then we have the ones that we uh we can play around with as well Limonene, Osemen, and Alpha Pinene. Right. If blended pro properly, they will give you that profile. These are terpenes, actually. And they all, that's another thing, you know, another, they come on in, uh, another connection with the, the plant kingdom is amazing when it comes to this and the so called essential oil uh, expression. And uh, uh, Humulus lupulus, cannabis, and, uh, sage, ginseng. And it, it's really fascinating. And how, those things are in a way interconnected. It's just, I'm, I'm chasing that, that final connection and, and it's just, just too much. And yet still very fascinating. I think there, there's actually a lot of um, potential resources in the, the chemicals in these plants. Um, you know, you mentioned that some of these terpenes acting as uh, on the endocannabinoid system, but um, I know that some of these also, um, like linalool, can actually bind to the GABA receptor. This is a receptor in the brain, and it's it's the same binding site that anti-anxiolytics um, basically bind to, like um, Valium. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there's there's a lot of uh, possibilities there to explore for medical use, um, and and of course that's really how hops started. It was. Um, used initially as, as a medical product, you know, back in like the 14, 1500s. And then, um, well, anybody want to tell the story about IPAs and how the, uh, the British started that? Um, well, Linus kind of did already and how uh, they packed uh, barrels with, uh, with fresh hops and send it to India pretty much. And uh, there, there it goes, Indian pale ale. And, and the, the reason that was so important is because the beer was going bad during the shipment because of the bacteria. But if, and they, and it turns out that alpha acids are antibiotics, right? We actually have that problem when we're making our sour beers. We have to be very careful not to get too many um, IBUs, you know, too much alpha acid in the beer or it'll inhibit the, uh, the lactobacillus from growing. Right. It's a good, a good thing for some beers and a bad thing for others. <laughs> I, I want to uh, be sure to, to leave some time to answer some of the questions um, that have come up. Um, there's, there's quite a few questions that we've gotten here. 
And um, I thought maybe a good one to start on it, to, you know, shift a little bit from the science to the humanities aspect is, um, you know, one of the concerns now is uh, diversifying the, the brewing community and, and the consuming community. Um, so, you know, I think mo most of us, when we go into a small brewery, we expect to see, you know, uh, white dudes with long beards, right? <clears throat> that's, that's the classic uh, stereotypical brewer. But um, of course, we want to be able to bring in other cultures and, and you know, really brewing started in many uh, diverse cultures and, and they have a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, so maybe you could talk, Linus and Bailey, about um, how you would like to see brewing diversified. And, and Bailey, especially you as, as a female brewer, um, that's it's unusual in today's world. Maybe you can talk about your experiences as a female brewer. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I've I've only had really positive uh, experiences myself with, with you know, other members of the industry. Certainly when uh, we were getting started, Linus, uh, I feel like I was calling him nonstop being like, you think I should put my fermenters here? <laughs> and like, how does a glycol loop run and stuff like that? And I, I think, you know, I've always had nothing but really positive uh, experiences with kind of the, the, the people who came before us and, and who really helped us along the way. And I, I think um, it's, a, it's a tough thing to tackle, certainly, but um, I think the most important thing is um, trying to make, make your, your business feel accessible to people. I think craft beer can be very intimidating sometimes uh, if you do feel like yeah, you're walking into a place where everyone really needs to know what's going on <laughs> or uh, if they're going to make you, um, yeah, yeah. If, if you're just getting into it, it, it can certainly be intimidating. And I think um, we try to create a, a atmosphere where people feel welcome and it, it's about uh, educating people and everyone just having a really positive experience. And um, I think that's true for us on the consumer side and, and also on the, you know, the employee side. And um, we try to make, make people feel really welcome and, and, and feel heard, you know, with our employees every year, we've started uh, kind of having uh, a little bit of an annual summit where I, we just, you know, it started during COVID time. So we have a Zoom uh, where everyone's come together and kind of comes uh, with ideas for um, new things they might want us to, to brew. And it doesn't matter if you are the lead brewer or a bartender, you're welcome to, uh, to throw out your ideas. Um, and uh, we've gotten some, some really fun ones. And, and, you know, again, they'll just kind of be the, the seed that someone's planting. And then we um, we've had some really neat things come out of that. And so I think, um, you know, that, and then there have been some, some big uh, collaborations the past couple of years that have come out of uh, a lot of the social movements that are, that are happening around the world and around the country. Um, and so uh, I think people um, are finding ways to connect, uh, connect the beer they're brewing with, um, with what, what's happening um, around around the country, so I think those are like are, are ways that uh, you can you can help it change. Linus, you want to <laughs> comment on any of that? Yeah, I think mean, um, Bailey said it really well. I mean, nobody wants to hear from a, a white dude with a beard anymore. Um, <laughs> which I happen to be, but uh, you know, as an industry, I, I think our um, our Brewers Association and a few other national organizations are really trying to take the lead on um, on diversity and inclusion you know, projects. Um, and then, yeah, there's been a lot of great collabs. You know, the um, the the one that you're doing, Bailey, the the Proud Noise, um, mm -hmm. uh, the Black is Beautiful one last year. Um, so yeah, as, as an industry, we're definitely trying to tackle that prop that that problem of uh, diversity in, in the business. Um, so one of the other questions here that um, has come up is uh, about the difference between um, porters and stouts, um, which 
my understanding is, is pretty arbitrary, but um, maybe you guys could comment on uh, a little of the history or how you approach the, the difference between those. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we make both. Uh, I've always understood that Porter was kind of the, the working man's beer um, in England, you know, what the, the, the porters unloading the, the ships every day would go in and have a, a couple pints at lunch and a couple pints after their work. And um, Stout just became a, a, a stout porter. It was a stronger, more roasted, darker beer than the regular porter. Um, and then, you know, stouts really became kind of the national drink of, um, of, of Ireland, really, when you get down to it. So there's not a whole lot of difference. It's, um, it's really how sweet, uh, traditionally, it'd really be how sweet or how roasted the, the beers were. Um, of course, now there's, stout can be just anything that's dark. I mean, you can throw, you know, chocolate pudding and uh, Oreos and, and bananas in there and call it a stout. But um, so the line is definitely blurred, uh, but I would say traditionally, you know, stouts would have been a lot more roasted uh, and black barleys used and porter would have been a lot sweeter on the finish. Okay, and um, we have another question about uh, dry hopping and um, more, uh, the, the audience seems to want more information about the process. Um, because, uh, for example, I know that people can use, you know, these like hop rockets and different things like that. Um, maybe you guys could talk about some of the technology that's out there. Uh, and Jay, I don't know if you want to comment on some of the radical things you've heard about. Oh, I, I mean, it's just the, the amount of products available right now for you can do it so many ways. And at, at the recent you were last time we were talking about Bailey brought up uh, the, the Rundle of, full of uh, pops pretty much. And, but uh, you can, you know, the, there are things, uh, you can buy a hop oil that it's very specific to a, to a cultivar. And, and you know, trying to, uh, trying, you can try to mimic that process. I believe maybe in a way, even in a more cost effective way, would that make sense, Bailey Linus? Yeah, again, it can, it can be, um, because you're again you're you're getting higher yields out of it um you're not going to have um as much and it's in a way it's cleaner process doing a bigger bigger scale you think it's much easier to handle just from processing perspective yes mm -hmm. it's just some might argue well is that still craft or is, isn't that really kind of cheating and mm -hmm. and uh, but it just it, it's it i mean again keeping in mind that it's at times challenging to get the, the hope that you're interested in, so. Yeah, we, we typically uh, dry hop with a technology called a ladder. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, <Important>. yeah, <laughs> so uh, mostly we're just, uh, again, um, uh, just, just climbing up and, and putting them in the old fashioned way. Of course, you're trying to minimize the amount of oxygen that's getting in there. Um, so we'll sometimes have, or we'll have like a, a canister of CO2 that will kind of keep up with us and, and try to uh, flush the oxygen out of the, uh, out of the kind of bucket that the hops are in. Um, we also, we do a lot of uh, adding aroma hops during the whirlpool. So after it's done uh, being boiled, we'll um, bring the temperature down to about 180 degrees um, and uh, add, add a decent amount of aroma hops then, uh, which again, they won't be isomerized. Uh, you're not going to get as much bitterness because it's not at that higher uh, boiling temperature uh, and you're able to get some aroma there too. So pre, you know, after the boil, before you would be dry hopping is, is when we do some as well. Linus, you guys do anything special with dry hopping? Um, no, you know, like I said, we, we've been playing around the last two or three years with the, the timing of when you'd add it during primary fermentation. Um, and like Anjay said, there, there's a lot of different uh, kind of processed hop uh, uh, products out there now where they've extracted just the you know, just some of the, 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 um, the alpha acids, if you just want to add some bitterness or if you extracted some of the oil, essential oils, if you're just trying to add it for dry hopping. But from a practical standpoint, um, the expense 
those are obviously more processed and a lot more expensive. And so it all kind of balances out from the way I see it. Um, using real hops, uh, you lose a lot of work in the kettle if you add it in the whirlpool. But again, if you're adding some of these more processed ingredients, you're paying up front for that. Okay. Um, one of the questions I, I, I had, um, um, maybe uh, a couple touched on this from the audience, but um, so there's a, an interest, and, and Bailey, you probably know about this from some anthropologists to try to analyze um, the ancient pottery, like Patrick McGovern uh, at Penn is, is analyzing some of the ancient pottery to try and determine what was used in some of these ancient beverages. Um, and then he works with Sam Caglione at Dogfish Head uh, to try and reproduce that beard. And somebody asked about book, a book to read uh, on the history. So Patrick McGovern has a couple books that might be interesting to, to read up on. But I was gonna ask uh, Linus and Bailey if, if you've ever considered doing like an ancient brew or um, have, have thought about that or looked into that? <laughs> uh, the closest we've come is when we tried to recreate the, uh, the old Gerst uh, recipe um, that we that we brew now, um, but you know the, the interesting thing about uh, trying to recreate ancient uh, recipes is all the barley varieties have changed so much over time. The hop varieties, um, what yeast they were using, um, you know what process they used to to brew with. I mean, and, you know before the you know before uh, metal um, you know metal pots were invented, you know you would actually add burning you know hot rocks to wooden vessels to get the boil to happen so i think even if you just had a list of ingredients um it'd be so tough to try to recreate exactly how those beers must have tasted back then yeah i think we do like we'll do some historical styles more than like trying to you know yeah do those really ancient ones um i think there is an interest now in kind of some historical beer styles. Like we did one a few years ago called Princess Wanda. That was a, a Polish style, a, a shop's beer. Um, I think um, uh, uh, Gosas are probably the biggest or the, the most popular um, currently style that has been uh, revived quite a bit. So again, uh, Gosas were, uh, 15th century style um, in, in Germany. Um, they are a beer that includes uh, salt and coriander. So um, when the Reinheitsgebot came out, um, the style kind of disappeared because it wasn't one of the main, uh, you know, those, those were not uh, the part of the four main ingredients in beer. It was illegal pretty much. Yeah, exactly. And so the really, honestly, the, the American uh, craft beer culture is what's uh, kind of led the way in bringing um, bringing that style uh, back to life a little bit. And I think among you know with we 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 used to brew one regularly uh, every summer called Casper, and I think we'll bring Casper back as well. Um, they they tend to be uh, and people again you know it kind of came about while the sour beer thing really started to come out too. So some people ours was like. A little bit tart, more like a, a Berliner. Some people's are very, very, very sour. Um, you know, like the, um, uh, yeah, so, some of them are, are, are quite sour. And so, um, but that that style, I think, is something that um, has shown. You know, there was kind of an, an interest in these historical styles, and, and that one actually really caught fire um, and has become um, a contemporary style again. <laughs> Uh, another series of questions seems to revolve around there, there. I think there's a number of home brewers on the, the webcast today, and they are interested in um, tips for home brewers in, in many different aspects. And so maybe everybody can comment on, on that and, and maybe think about how you, Bailey, and Linus um, start a new beer. You know, you obviously aren't going to brew a, you know, a, 10 barrel batch of something that you haven't even tried before. But um, what, what about just some tips for home brewers? Uh, Anjay, you're, you're a long time home brewer. 
with great success, what, what would you uh, suggest as a, a common tip to? Uh, I mean, don't get discouraged by the by amount of cleaning and do learn your equipment because that's what really in the beginning, that's what it is. And you, you and I think that's what's kind of, it, it's tough when you start because you, you, you're excited, you got all those things, you, you get it going and, and then it's just, uh, I, I don't know anyone who got at the first time what they really wanted. It's just, it's not really possible. You, and, you know, again, j just, it's not really a tip, but it's more of a kind of, you know, do, do not lose your motivation to something that you love. It's just give it a little bit of time, give it some patience and, and learn your equipment again. And, and, you know, the other thing that people do not realize before they come in here that Cleaning, cleaning is really the major part, part in, in, in homebrewing, in, in an actual process or a craft beer facility brewing. And uh, yeah, I would say the, the cleaning is about to 60% of the actual process, if that makes sense. If you guys disagree, uh, uh, please. But uh, yeah, my tip is just uh, yeah, keep your passion. It's, it's, it's going to pay out. You, it's three, four times, and you're going to get what you're actually after. And, and everybody will love it, including yourself. And don't be too critical on yourself. So that's what I do. <laughs> Linus, you want to give us any? Uh, yeah, I'll just write. I mean, I think brewers are really just glorified janitors for yeast, <laughs> cleaning up after yeast when you get to. Yeah. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, you know, we, we prepare the feast, and then we have to clean up when it's done. So. Uh, no, but my, my tips would be um, uh, your yeast health is really important. Um, you know, sure, you can get the packets of dried yeast and, and make a pretty good product with it. But if you really want to be consistent, you know, uh, getting liquid yeast cultures and growing them up to make sure that you have a healthy uh, starter of, of what you're going to pitch into the into the beer is really important. Um, but yeah, you can you can make great beer with you know, with plastic buckets and a, and a stovetop uh, cooker. Um, uh, bottling uh, sucks, I have to say that. <laughs> so as soon as you can afford a, a little home uh, keg system, you'll enjoy uh, home brewing a whole lot more. Um, and then my tip is uh, get to know your local homebrew store. Um, you know, my long time one was All Seasons Brewing Supply. Uh, unfortunately, they closed a year or so ago. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the people you can talk to and buy ingredients from, uh, meet up with other homebrewers, you know, join a club, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, it's a very solitary uh, hobby sometimes, but the, it's most fun when you can get together and share what you've made with other people. Ailey? Yeah, I mean, I think Andres and, and Linus really hit pretty much everything. I was going to say cleaning and, yeah, switch from bottles to kegs. Uh, that really helps. And I, I think, uh, yeah, just trying to learn about why you're doing what you're doing um, rather than just kind of going through the motions will really help you with that and, and help you not cut corners as well because you realize uh, why, why it's important to go through all these cleaning steps or why it's important um, to get your, your temperatures right. I did see, I think at some point um, people submitted questions and someone asked about why they maybe weren't getting good primary fermentation when they were getting a good secondary fermentation and to me that could be a temperature issue on your mash um, and so I, either too too hot or too cold um, and so uh, uh, yeah whoever that is I, I think that might be a mash temp issue but um, I think uh, yeah just just trying to learn about why why you're doing what you're doing will really help you and then uh, another question that had come up was, um, what's the difference between beer and wine in the fermentation process? Uh, you, you don't have to stomp on the, the grapes to get <laughs> beer. No, uh, I mean, there, obviously there's, there's, on a broad scale, you're, you're basically adding some type of sugar source to, and yeast to it. Um, the boiling helps sterilize it, which with uh, wine, you're not quite as, as worried about um, because you're going to do other things afterwards to kind of stabilize the beer. But I mean, the wine. Um, but yeah, they're very similar. Um, the yeast kind of work the same way. 
yeah, I, there's not big differences, but just besides stepping on the grapes, I think. Well, of course, to me, probably the biggest difference is the the mash process, where you rely on the, the enzymes in the barley to convert the starch to sugar, while with grapes, you just smash them up and then you you have a sugar water that can be fermented directly, right? Um, so uh, the one of the last questions we have to before we close up here is uh, some recommended reading. So anybody have any uh, books that they would recommend? Um, the 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 joy of home brewing is one that that I would definitely recommend. Um, I think for home brewers, it's kind of your bible, right? Um, anybody have recommendations that they would make? Anjay's raising his hand here. Yeah. <laughs> if you consider yourself a hop head and you have not read For the Love of Hops by Stan Hieronymus, uh, start being honest with yourself, read the book, and then you can enter the realm of the hop head. The language this book is written, you don't have to have any background in, in, in science at all. I, that's why I love Stan Hieronymus in this book. It's it, it's just really, I read it overnight pretty much. And, and it was like, it, it's, it's a story. He tells the story pretty much that at times becomes very technical. And um, I can go on and on about this book. Yeah, read this book. If, you, if you're into brewing, it's, it's really, you learn a lot from this book. And this is not a, a <clears throat> marketing ploy in any way. I just, this is my favorite book in this industry. Well, we're, we're at the top of the hour, a little over actually. Um, and I, I wanna thank all of our participants, uh, both those who joined the web, webinar and especially Linus, Bailey and Anjay for joining us today to talk about something we could probably go on for days talking about, but I will just uh, wrap up and say thank you to everybody and go home this evening and have a homebrew or a craft brew. Hey. Thank you.